Nation, I am Jamie Beckett. You know who you are. Welcome to the 100th episode of In Flight Coffee with M0A. I know what you're saying to yourself. You're saying, where's Jason? Why is Jamie on? Jamie's okay, but Jamie's not Jason. And this is true, but you've met Magda. Magda's devious. You don't know this about her, but she is. She's very devious. And when we all set our clocks ahead for spring, she set Jason's back an hour. So Jason is two hangers over, hanging out with another guy. Doesn't even know we've started yet. But we have started, and this is going to be a pretty cool day because we're doing in-fly coffee, not in the kitchen, but in the hangar, where? At Rex Air in Naples, because that's the place to go eat, right? <laughs> There's actual people here. There are live people in the hangar. Let's see who's online. Um, who do we have here? Holly Bott. I've actually met Holly Bott and Hunter Timko. Keith Young, Eric Deagle, Danny Carson, Pete Schuster. Man, you guys are from all over the place. Give me a thumbs up if the weather is as spectacular at your place as it is here. Craig Gleason, Chris, Mike Zzzz, Katie Kelsch. This is just fantastic. I absolutely love this. Folks, this is going to be a great in-flight coffee because it's our our 100th in-flight coffee, and I promise you, Jason will be here at some point, but before we bring him in, let's take a little trip down memory lane, shall we? Let's look at Jason. Hey, M08 Nation, welcome to the Shepherd Kitchen. I wanna get uh, Facebook pulled up real quick so I can see your comments. And then we're gonna dive into our new series, In Flight Coffee with Jason. Not everybody like the name In Flight Coffee, I want you to know, but I, I, I like the name In Flight Coffee. Let's, uh, let's get this loaded here. Here we go, look at that, I got it there. Let me pull this up so I can see your comments as well. Super. I got that. I see a bunch of you jumping on now. I got comments pulled up. Anyways, something totally different. Maybe I'm going crazy because we're here on a stay at home order. Uh, I don't know what that is, but um, we're certainly going to talk aviation today. I know many of you out there are coffee lovers, especially on a Saturday afternoon. It's how I spend my Saturday afternoons with a book and, uh, and a cup of coffee nowadays. Uh, instead, I want to spend it with a cup of coffee and spend it with you guys. But first things first, we need to make that cup of coffee. So I'm gonna get set up here. Coach Ray, great to see you. Bradley, you're not married to anybody today? Is it, is it, do you get a Saturday off? This is the profession you chose. Hey, speaking of Coach Ray, you know, I don't know, I'm not one to brag. I don't know if you've noticed, I've almost finished all my Bearded Man coffee. Well, you know, the Bearded Man coffee is treating me well. So fantastic, good, uh, good to see you all here. We're loading up with some Bearded Man coffee. That's what we're gonna end up making here today while we get ready to chat VFR and IFR radio communications. Good morning, Magda here, setting up for in-flight coffee today, but I need your help, please. Jason is an absolute genius in remembering all these FAA acronyms and, and all the codes from the far aim and you name it. But let me tell you, homeboy cannot remember to turn his coffee machine on and prepare a spoon from the drawer. That's it. Two things. Can do it. It doesn't matter. I text it to him. I leave sticky notes around the, the kitchen. Nope can do it. So today, please, when he makes his cup of coffee right at 1 p.m. on the M0A Facebook page, please blow up the chat. He's going to see it right here on the screen. Blow up the chat with spoon emojis. He's going to look at the chat and think, what the heck is going on? So it's going to be our inside joke. 
because I'm not preparing the spoon for him again today. So if you can help me, please let me know in the chat if I can count on you. I will see you at 1 p.m. Please be on time because he's making the coffee at the very beginning at 1 p.m. I will see you then. Thank you. Add some of that, but what is the Missouri Nation doing for a great Saturday? Hey, Bradley, hey, Jeff, hey, Ray, hey. I can't see, everyone's posting a giant emoji in the chat and it's too far away to see. Eric, Alex, what's up, Mitch? I'm slightly confused, but I love you guys. Brian, good to see you. It's a homeboy, I like that. I need a spoon, is that, or is it? What is happening? I feel like I, I, I'm a little bit, is there a spooning convention? Did I miss a spooning convention? I mean, I, I um, Magdalena, there could be a spooning convention. What are you doing now over there? I feel like I'm a, not a part of a good inside joke. I, <laughs> you, you are, she is up to, we will get to that in a second. We're, we're just making this a strong coffee. I'm not getting all the water in here. Cut. Come here. <laughs> what? Sorry. When you were playing outside with the kids, yes. I had to tell everybody that you can't remember to turn on your coffee maker. No, no, that's not true. Spoon. That is not true. I remember lots of things. No. You want to ask me about 91205? Psh, I'm your guy. Eight tomato flames plus flaps. But then there's grab card in there too. In flight coffee mugs. We have about 150 of these babies mm -hmm. and we are giving them away. I have one here too. They are beautiful. Uh, first off, they are beautiful. Um, if you haven't seen the picture, and I'll show you up close here in a second. There is a camel on here. Why is there a camel on here? Well, who, Eric Deagle, you started this commercial airplane multi-engine land. Um, and there's also hashtag clear prop on here. I wonder who's responsible for that. I have no idea. Yeah, it, it, exactly, exactly. Let me, let me tell you, let me show you instead of telling you why. Let me see. <laughs> Clear prop. m 0 Nation, what is happening? Look, look who I found, look, look who I found. He was just walking around aimlessly and I just wanted to give him some aim. Hey, m 0 nice to see you out there, folks. I hope you're having as much fun as we are. Welcome to In-Flight Coffee. I learned this is episode 86. Jamie had to look that up for me and tell me that was episode 86. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, a guest, guest, guest appearance. Hey, look at that good looking guy. Look at that good, we, we don't, do we want to see you? Get down, get down so it don't look so whoa, short. Whoa, 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 look at all these people. How, wow, look at, this guy's been going, lifting weights, Valerie. Like, what? Wow. How's, how's the MZ-Ray crew doing out there? Are you yeah. I mean, you're looking good. Oh, you're looking good. If I could grow a beard like you, I'd probably get more views. That's the Silver Fox. The Silver Fox. Have a blessed, amazing, outstanding rest of your day. I'll see you next Saturday for In-Flight Coffee from the kitchen, the kitchen studio. Anyways, there'll be a new environment. It's going to be an awesome, awesome episode next week. Have an amazing day, and most importantly, remember, the good pilot is always a good morning. Have a great day, everybody. I'll see ya. What is happening, m Nation? Jason Shepard here. Welcome to episode 100 of In-Flight Coffee. Thanks for letting me take you a little bit down memory lane. We are here at Rexair in Naples today, and not that you all online aren't that dedicated, but we've got a really dedicated audience here as well. Give yourself a round of applause for coming out. Absolutely fantastic. Now, let me say hi to some people online and everything else. What's happening, Dory? Good to see you. John Dela Cruz, good to see you as well. Eric Pittman, he's basically the CEO of Publix. If anybody here ever needs anything from Publix, that's your guy you go to right there. Thomas Gerber, Keith Hunter, Jarrett, Holly, awesome to see you. Holly, you did fly this, this very, very plane, the beautiful blue uh, Cirrus. William Charles McMillan, as always, good to see you. Claire Musfara, fantastic.
Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you uh, to everybody here in person. Thank you to everybody watching online. There's a lot of things you could be doing on a Saturday afternoon, but you have just taken time to find ways to better yourself as a pilot. And I wanna honor that commitment to you all. First off, here's how this is gonna work today. My coffee is already pre-made. Uh, we're sponsored by Dunkin' Donuts today, apparently, because that, that's what we got. There's no honey in it, though, so it's just not as good as it normally is. But anyways, we have our coffee. Also, is, has anybody seen Marty Miller out there? Give me one second. Marty Miller uh, sent over from Brooklyn, New York, Junior's Cheesecakes. So everybody here, you're leaving with a cheesecake. I feel like Oprah, right? You're going to get a cheesecake, and you're going to get a cheesecake, and it's just going to be fantastic. So we have cheesecake. You're welcome to come around, we'll, we'll move it over there, um, and, uh, and you can grab cheesecake if you need a little sugar rush, you know, or anything like that uh, in the meantime. Now, everybody here, including giving stuff away like cheesecake, you're gonna walk away with something awesome. We have these uh, fantastic Emsere mugs. You can kind of pick and choose from there. I believe we have enough from everybody. If not, we'll find a way to take care of you. Also, watching online, we're gonna do some fantastic giveaways. Oh, there's Magda got the camera up, perfect. There's everybody. Magda got the camera up. So we're gonna play a fun little game with this. We're at the airport, and there's gonna be a million different airplanes taxiing by. We'll have to stop for audio anyways. Magda's gonna switch to her, basically it's airplay and her phone. Whoever guesses correctly in the chat, first one that I see, that way I can make up the rules as I go along. First one that I see that gets the correct answer of which aircraft taxis by, we're gonna send you something. Then at the very, very end, we'll head over here to the check ride books. And in the check ride books, we'll, uh, we'll do a little fun mock check ride here at the end as well. So we'll be giving away a bunch of stuff, mugs, everything else, uh, flights with Jamie Beckett. I mean, he'll do, he'll do just about anything. So it's gonna be, it's gonna be fantastic. Uh, no, Jamie won't be in the Cub. I'm sorry. So it's just that's just how it works. Um, let's dive into it here today because again, I want to honor your time. I might go a little bit longer than I normally do. I'll try to stop us by by two. I'll do my best. You all hold me accountable to stop us by two o'clock, but some of y'all know how I like to ramble sometimes. Uh, today we're going to dive into um, an accident, and I hate talking about accidents that involve fatalities but I believe we're doing the individuals that were in those accidents and those pilots a disservice if we don't take the time to learn from those. And today we're actually looking at an accident that is from the airline space. You're gonna see the deterioration of CRM. We know CRM as crew resource management. And I want you to watch as we build this scenario, I want you to put yourselves in the shoes of the pilots. And I want you to just watch the breakdown in communication as we really work through all of that. And then of course, we'll leave with some three actionable steps that we can really take from there. So let's go ahead, let's dive into it. By the way, I can see the chat over here. So you all feel free uh, to comment in there and everything else if you all have questions or anything like that. And you guys can wave when there's a good comment or your own comment or anything like that as well. Uh, let's dive into it here. Let's get the uh, animation loaded. You have it, sweetie? My computer's not behaving, that's fine. I'll get it going again here, give me one second. We will get that going. And then I wanna share with you American Airlines Flight 965. Is it behaving now, sweetie? Still not behaving? All right, give me just one second here. You got it? How about that? It, it should be black, it should be black. That's, that's probably what you're thinking. All right, let's dive into it, let's switch to it. And let's do American Airlines Flight 965. There we go. So again, those of you watching here in person, we're just gonna be eyes up here. Everybody at home is gonna to get to see that full screen. That is acting up a little bit, huh? It's the HDMI. Give me just one second to get the HDMI in a better little spot here so it behaves nicely. Will you check your cable too, Magdalena? To make sure it's plugged in all the way. And then we'll roll from there. I think it might have just been pulling a little bit too much. Don't you blame. I know someone out there is thinking this is because it's a Mac computer. It's definitely not because it's a Mac, you Android Windows lovers over there. All right. You got that. Look at those pe pretty people. All right, you ready? Now we're really diving into it. Now we're really diving into it. Let's see how well it's going to behave. Oh, that's the in-flight coffee video. My bad. American Airlines, flight 965, like I was saying. 
actually was a routine flight uh, from Miami International Airport, Ivan. Uh, December 20th, 1995, dealing with the Christmas Day rush, heading down to Cali, Colombia. Cali, Colombia is on the western side of Colombia, really in a valley. You've got the Andes Mountains up to 14,000 feet on either side. Really no moon. Uh, pushed back from gate D33. I walked by gate D33 not too long ago. It was kind of creepy because that's what I was thinking about. Um, they were a little bit late as they pushed back. We have two pilots on board, Captain Nicholas Tafuri and First Officer Don Williams, both uh, former Air Force fighter pilots. In fact, First Officer Williams was even named Instructor of the Year by the Air Force. So some very, very qualified pilots sitting up front here. Now, this flight, regularly scheduled flight. In fact, the captain had made this flight 13 times before. However, all those flights were in the daytime. Maybe it never... Uh, I'm sorry, all those flights were at nighttime. Maybe you'd never seen the mountains before. Despite their one hour delay, the flight was uneventful until that descent began into Cali. Now at the time, Cali had no radar. So they relied on position reports from pilots and had to trust that the pilots knew where they were. So the typical approach was to fly the prescribed approach, which I'll show you here in just a second. Um, I'll actually leave that up for you here. They're to fly this prescribed approach um, on in and make their position report. So you can see here at the top of your screen, they'd overfly Tolua. Once my screen comes back, give it a second here. There we go. Overfly Tolua, continue on down to Rosa, uh, Roso, and then in to Cali, as you can see here. Let's start to build this scenario because I'm sure as pilots, we've all had that moment where you think you're getting one approach. Who, who here's ever like, you know, oh, I'm definitely gonna get runway 36 or whatever. You listen to the ATIS, it's runway 36. The next thing you know, it's runway 18. Anybody in the chat ever had that happen? Yeah, I know I'm land 36. You've even like, I've sequenced the approach before. I am ready to go, it's definitely 36. Here I am 10 miles out from the airport. And they go, oh yeah, we're landing 18 now. And now you're scrambling to get this new approach plate out. Well, that's what really happens here. Let's uh, look at the, uh, the voice recordings here. Cali approaches, 965, Cali. Uh, nine or six five, go ahead, please. Cali approach, sir, the winds are calm. Are you able to approach runway one niner? Captain talking to his first officer. Uh, do you want to shoot the, the, the one nine straight in? First officer says, uh, yeah, we'll have to scramble to get down, but we can do it. Can we, can we make a promise to each other <laughs> that if you have to think like, well, I got to scramble to get down. Like I'm way too high right now. If I hustle, I can get it done. If I just work a little bit hard, if I just work a little bit faster, I can get that done. You know, aviation is, is unforgiving. We don't call AAA and we pull over on the side of the road and ask for assistance, right? There is no scrambling to get things done. So if we're making a link and there are links in the chain of events, I think the first link happens when let's scramble, that's their words, to get down. Our story continues here. Uh, yeah, this is talking to the approach now, the captain. Uh, yes, sir, we're getting to lower altitude right away though. Cali approaches Roger, American Niner 65 is cleared to VOR DME approach runway 19er. Rozo number one arrival. This is key, watch this. Report to Lua VOR. Cleared VOR DME to 19, Rozo one arrival will report the VOR. Thank you, sir. Report uh, to Lua VOR. He comes back, report to Lua. Captain, now they're talking amongst themselves. All right, I've got to give you that Tolua first of all. You, uh, you want to go right to Cali or to Tolua? Well, first officer says, I, I think he said the Rosa one arrival. Yeah, he did. Don't worry, we have time to pull that out. We'll go ahead and we'll get that chart pulled out there. Now, this is the chart they're working to, to pull out here and you can see all this. Now, despite being slightly high, they decide to accept this, this approach. If we can show the approach um, again on in there. Now, I, I wanted to emphasize the report to Lua. In a radar, in a non-radar environment, you have to make position reports. So the pilot in his mind was saying, okay, if I have to report to Lua, it must remain in front of me. And that's a logical thought. However, because they didn't quite have situational awareness, they were already past the Tolua VOR. So as they're trying to queue up Tolua, they keep getting told it's back behind them. They think, what is wrong with this? They had the previous approach loaded up. Maybe it's something pulling from the previous approach. Why does it keep saying I need to fly a completely 180 degrees back around the other direction? It's because they had already passed Tolua. So here we are descending through the Andes Mountains, as you can see, uh, as we work our way in. Now, 
there was another interesting thing. Once they realized they were past Tolua, and you'll see this in the voice recordings in a second, they decided they're just gonna go directly to Rozo, which is an NDB. For you young people, there used to be a thing called NDBs. It was like this revolutionary technology. It's not so revolutionary anymore. They wanted to go directly to Rozo. But look at the identifier. Look at the NDB info box. The identifier for Rozo is just the letter R. Well, when you type in just the letter R, you can imagine you get a plethora of things in your FMS in the database. So they just hit the first R thing, and that must be Rozo. And it actually takes them to a fix that's backed by Bogota. And the autopilot starts to turn the airplane back towards that because of multiple R's in the database. Let's listen to this now. OK, so we're clear down to five now. Captain, that's right. And off Rozo, which I'll tune here. You see what I get? He's saying, you see what I get? It's wanting to take us this direction. I know that's not the direction it is. Yes, is the first officer. Captain, I, I think this is the approach brief. I don't know, but listen. He says, at 21 miles, at 5,000, that's part of the approach, OK? OK, uh, I don't know what he was getting at. Maybe that was his attempt at an approach brief there. The captain, off ULQ. So let me put in ULQ here, 17.7. Cali approach, 965, distance now. Uh, what do you want, sir? Distance, DME. OK, the distance from uh, Cali is uh, 38. First officer goes, where are we? Do you see situational awareness eroding here? Let's go right to Tolua, first of all, OK? Yeah, where are we heading, says the first officer. 17.7, ULQ, uh, I, I don't know, what is this, what is this ULQ here? And the alarming thing is, what is this ULQ? ULQ is the identifier of Tolua, of where they're trying to find themselves. They don't know, is this R, is this ULQ, is it Tolua, is it Rozo? Where on earth are they going as we continue to descend into the valley, in between the Andes Mountains, and we have this breakdown in the flight deck? And any time, we can pause here for a second, but unfortunately in the aircraft, we can't really press the pause button at all. Like I said, there's no call AAA and press the pause button like we can in a simulator. We can pause here, and I know watch online, you are seeing this, and certainly here I see your face as you're seeing this, you're going, uh, I can go around at any point, right? I can go around here at 14,000 feet. I, I can go around at any point in my approach, and let's figure this thing out. But there's always that pressure to get there. It's the Christmas Day rush. I, 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 you feel the need to be somewhere, and we have this breakdown in communication. Let's continue on as our descent continues here. Let's uh, come to the right a little bit. First officer, yeah, he's wanting to know where we're heading. Talking about ATC. Uh, I'm going to give you direct to Lua. Remember, Tulua's back around behind us. OK, right now, says the captain. OK, you got it? OK. It's like the first officer's kind of checked out, I feel like, in a way. OK, he says. And uh, that's on your map. It should be. Yeah, it's a left turn. They're confused. The autopilot now rolls from a left to a right turn as the altitude passes through 13,600 feet. The heading reaches 100 degrees before the direction of the turn is then reversed. Imagine you're a passenger on this. We're heading this direction. Now we're heading back this direction. Nighttime through the Andes Mountains. You can see the chain of events building here. Captain, yeah, I got to identify that. We'll, we'll bleep, bleep that part out. He's trying to identify uh, ULQ in this point. OK, uh, I'm getting 17.7. It just doesn't look right on mine. I, I, I don't know why. You hear the sound of ULQ, Tolua, VOR, tuned up appropriately. You hear the Morse code uh, actually in the, in the black box recording here. Left turn. So you want a left turn back around to ULQ. The first officer knows that ULQ, Tolua, is back behind them. He's trying to confirm with the captain. So you want me to make this big left-hand turn all the way back around to Tolua, which honestly may not have been that bad of an idea with a little power, climb up, and let's just go shoot the full approach again, start from scratch. I think we've all had landings like that where even your downwind is so sloppy and the base is sloppier than you're on final. And for some reason, we decide to continue landing, even though we know a perfect landing starts with a perfect pattern, and we still fly all over the place. Sometimes it's best just to go around on the downwind or at the beginning of the approach, like this in this case. So now the aircraft rolls from a right turn to a left turn. Six degrees left bank. The aircraft rolled into a right turn again. Bank angle now to 20 degrees. The captain says, no, heck no. Let's press on to, press on to where, says the first officer. Tolua. That's a right-hand turn. Where are we going? Come to the right. This is the captain talking. Uh, let's go to Cali, first of all. Let's go. We got messed up here, didn't we? Yeah, says the first officer. Tolua, Rozo, ULQ, 
We got messed up here. He didn't say messed up. I bleeped that out to keep it a PG show for everybody here. Um, again, you have the opportunity to go around at any point on any approach. You know, some of the most powerful words in the pilot controller glossary you all know are the words unable. I'm, I'm unable. I'm going to go around. I'm going to do this thing again. I'm in a pilot in command. I have that final authority to that responsibility with that. So let's continue on with our story. Captain, let's go direct uh, CLO, that's direct Cali. Now we're just gonna go direct Cali. By the way, I hear, an, is there an airplane coming for our first? Okay, we're gonna take a break because there's an airplane coming. Mag, let's cut to it. First giveaway, what is it? Let's see. Oh wow, this is gonna be a good one. Oh, I know what this is. All right, what is it? What is it in the chat, in the chat, what is it? Put it in the chat. And don't say X insurance. They're doing really well with insurance sales, aren't they? My goodness, good for, good for them. I appreciate that. All right, let's see it in the chat. Anybody here know what it is? Anybody here know what it is? Yeah? I think it's a Falcon 50 as well. It's certainly a Falcon or something. You see those three engines like that, yeah. Let's see. Did anybody see the tail number? I should have looked that up so it was like more official. Air traffic controller. It's a Falcon of some sort. I'm gonna go with, um, hold on, let's go down, let's go down, let's go down. Let's see, I'm going with, where, I, did I walk off camera or my camera freeze, Magda? Oh, I'm on the other camera, there we go. I'm gonna say, uh, uh, let's see, I think Claire won something last week, didn't she? I think, Claire, Claire did you win something last week? Uh, I gotta give it to my buddy, my buddy Brian. Brian knows his stuff. Brian Schiff, Falcon 900, I believe it was a Falcon 900. Some insurance company, it's doing really, really well. Congratulations, Brian. We're gonna send you something, good job, good job. We're gonna send you something, Brian. So Brian, reach out to us. How do you wanna email? You wanna let Sarah handle it? Let's see, yeah, we'll send it to Sarah. Sarah at m0a.com. Here's the criteria though. The subject line must say, I'm a winner, Jason said so. If not, I mean, we, we, we manifest what we put out there, right? I'm a winner, Jason said so. That's the subject line, then send your shipping information. Barry will send you out a mug with that. All right, let's continue on with our story here. Let's take that chat down, thanks Magda. All right, um, go direct CLO. How did we get messed up here? Captain, talking again, come to the right, right now. Come to the right, right now. First officer, yeah, we're in a heading select to the right. The captain now talking on the radio. And American uh, 38 miles north of Cali, and you want us to go to Tolua, then do the Rozo to uh, the runway, right? To runway 19. You hear the captain's words and you just have to think like, Who's flying the airplane at this point is what I'm thinking about uh, as, I, uh, as I read through this. Our story continues here. Cali Approach, Niner 65, you can land runway 19er. You can use runway 19er. What is your altitude and DME from Cali? Captain on the radio says, uh, we're 37 DME at 10,000 feet. Captain, you're okay. We're in good shape now. I guess he's reassuring his first officer, I'm not sure. Captain, we're heading, uh, Cali Approach steps on him. Uh, report a 5,000 and final runway 19er. Captain, thinking out loud, we're heading the right direction. You wanna, and as, as they're, um, as they're, make sure I didn't skip a slide there, sorry. You, um, there we go. You wanna, and the aircraft still in this 20 degree right bank. Rate of descent starts decreasing from 2,700 feet per minute as the pitch attitude increases and airspeed decreases. Altitude passes now below 10,000 feet. The peaks are 14,000 feet through the Andes that we're traveling through. We're below the highest peaks now um, as we're traveling. I wish our story stopped there with a go around or a successful landing, but unfortunately it continues. I made the show PG for you again. He says, something bad. You wanna take run that one nine yet? Like, let's go direct to the runway numbers in a way. Come to the right, come to the right for, uh, to Ca Cali for now, okay? Okay, says the first officer. Captain, it's that messed up Tolua. I'm not getting it for some reason. See, I can't, okay, now Tolua's messed up. Now it must be the VOR's fault, because it's certainly not our pilot's fault. It must be technology's fault. So the VOR's messed up, because every time he puts it in, it's showing it back behind him and they still can't figure out why, even though they know their distance in DME, uh, their distance from the airport. First officer comes back and says, okay, yeah, but I can put it in the box if you want. First officer, finally, there's some wisdom here. I don't want Tolua. Let's just go to the extent, extended center line of, uh, which is Rozo. Rozo, says the first officer. 
why don't you just go direct Rozo then, all right? Okay, let's. I feel like, it seemed like a little sassy to me, like, let's. Uh, that's how I read it, at least, I don't know. Captain, I'm gonna put that over to you. First officer, uh, get some altimeters. We're out of 10 now. All right, they're thinking smart here. Callie approaches, Roger, distance now. Five seconds later, we get our first terrain warning. You can show it, please. Um, terrain, terrain, right? Pull up, triggers. The pitch attitude's at four and a half degrees, nose up. Roll attitude's at 12 degrees, right. Uh, right. Air speed's down to 234 knots. The rate of descent's 1,500 feet per minute. The altimeter, we're 8,480 feet. The radar altimeter, so remember a radar altimeter, that's an altimeter shooting straight down to the ground, telling us our true AGL, and it's always changing, right? We're only at 1,476 AGL. At this point, because of that warning, the autopilot disengages and the master uh, warning is activated. There's some curse words, as you can imagine. You hear the sound of the autopilot disconnect. Pull up, baby, says the captain. You hear the, the sound of the stick shaker. Now, the pitch attitude increases to 31 degrees. The aircraft rolls out of this right turn, reaches a 13 degree left bank. Master caution still issued as the radar altitude decreased below 500 feet. That's AGL. Radar altimeter decreases to 109 feet, and airspeed in this big old airplane drops down to 187 knots. It's okay, says the first officer. You hear pull up in the background. Okay, easy does it, easy does it. You hear the sound of the autopilot disconnect warning. You hear the sound of the stick shaker stops. First officer says, nope. Captain says, up, baby. There we go. You hear the stick shaker start and continue till impact. More, more, says the captain. Okay, up, up. You hear terrain again. And that's the end of our voice recording. American Airlines Flight 965 impacted a mountain. Um, El, uh, how do I say it, Magda? The flood, El Diluvio, something like that, El Diluvio. Uh, that's my Spanish translator. Um, the flood is what it meant. And they almost cleared it. In fact, the NTSB, when they went back to do the investigation, they determined that uh, if the flight would have retracted its speed brakes in the go around, they would have just barely cleared the mountain. American Airlines at the time didn't include the retraction of speed brakes um, in its flight manual. Now they do. However, they didn't uh, back then. And unfortunately, as you can imagine, that ended in fatalities. But could you see the breakdown in communication? Could you see the, the tension, the kind of fighting amongst themselves and, and almost bickering in a way and the confusion, yet we continued to press on? When we get confused, I'll take a step further, when we get a little bit scared, the right thing to do in an airplane isn't always to keep putting one foot in front of the other and continuing on. Um, show of hands and, and participate too in the chat and everything else, I can see all this here. Who has ever scared themselves just a little bit in an airplane? Any, anybody here ever scared themselves in an airplane? Uh, yeah. Uh, how about Jamie's jumping up and down over here? How about over in the chat? Let's see it. Who has ever scared themselves uh, in, um, in an airplane a little bit. Because I want to talk briefly about the science of this, the science of when we get that adrenaline dump and what actually happens to us really biologically with this. Look at all the me's coming in the chat here. Jim, Nick, Danny, yeah, I see you out there. I, I think if you spend, Lisa, good to see you, Brandon, uh, Michael Phillips says, oh yes. Yeah, I'm with you. Michael J. McMurray says, absolutely. Jennifer Johnson, yeah, I got the hand raise emoji. If you spend enough time in aviation, something will happen. Do we want to do a, uh, another giveaway, Magda? Are we ready? I mean, if we, th this, is, this is good. I mean, it's beautiful, it's majestic, uh, it's, it's not very fast. What is it? Jamie, do you want to get, you want to try? I think even Jamie, I think even Jamie might get it. We'll let that shut down. That's good old Papa Mike. Who's my winner? Put it in the chat, who's my winner? I got, the, I got the chat blowing up over here. Let's see, let's see. Thank you, Nick Belfino is our winner with the 172. I mean, that's like a give me, but with Nick, you're our winner. Congratulations. Email Sarah, subject line, I'm a winner. Jason said so. And with your shipping information, it will get it sent out to you. So I was asking earlier, who's ever scared themselves in an airplane? And I don't know how else to politely put this. If you spend enough time in aviation, you're, you're gonna get the jitters at some point or another. You're gonna, you're gonna scare yourself a little bit in an airplane if you spend enough time in it. 
but I want to share with you a little bit um, about the science that really goes uh, that really goes into this. What happens um, scientifically? I'm looking at the chat here as well. I know there's a little bit of delay and everything else with that. Italian Mark, good to see you. We already finished all your coffee, um, by the way. You see, when we get an adrenaline dump. An adrenaline dump is the kind of thing that you see someone who moves a car off the railroad tracks and saves the family. Like adrenaline sends all that focus, all that blood to your, to your muscles to be able to do something extraordinary. But when it takes that blood, that oxygenated blood, it takes it away from things like the brain. So we don't always communicate effectively. We don't always make the best decisions with this. Um, I'll give you an example. My, my mother is here, so she'll have to cover her ears so she can't hear one of my scary airplane stories or anything like that. Actually, I, my in-laws and my parents are here, so it's like, it's like a full circle day. Um, so mom, don't listen to this, I apologize. But when I lost cylinder number three, taken off runway, now it's runway 10, it was about runway nine or back then, at the Marion County Airport, I remember, again, you have a Cessna 150 running on only three cylinders. It's a violent little process. We're horizontally opposed, right? So it's, it's you know, kind of hitting unevenly there. I remember the adrenaline dump hits. I lower the nose. I made one and only one radio call. One, two Romeo's coming back. That's all I said. I, I, didn't, I couldn't think of anything else to do other than lower the nose and say those words. I didn't say another word. Thankfully, there was no one else in the pattern. Thankfully, it was an uncontrolled, pilot-controlled feel. I nursed my way all the way back around and had a successful landing, a story for another day, but that's that adrenaline dump. Um, look at it actually this way here. Um, we all know the miracle on the Hudson, Cactus 1549. But listen to the communication breakdown with this. Captain Sullenberger calls up, not even a coherent sentence, mayday, 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 this is Cactus 1539, gets his own flight number incorrect, hit birds, lost thrust, both engines, turning back towards LaGuardia. Patrick Harton, sitting in approach, uh, calls, tower, stop your departures, we've got an emergency returning, who is it? It's 1529, again, incorrect, uh, incorrect flight number. He, uh, bird strike, lost all engines. That was the whole sentence. Now. It communicated the message appropriately, but when adrenaline hits, when we get that dump, what really happens to us is we fall back to primacy. We fall back to the base of the English language. We fall back to our, our, most, our, our primary skill set. This is why I encourage you, especially those of you that are student pilots, building the strong foundation now, because when things hit the fan, you go back to primacy. I love sharing uh, stories from the law enforcement environment because also um, high adrenaline uh, type industry, just like we have. Uh, Matt, who serves as our COO at M0A.com, was a former law enforcement uh, officer in Wisconsin, actually. I saw the Wisconsin shirt over here as well, the Brewer's shirt over here. Um, so Matt was sharing that in his squad car, uh, when he would go lights and sirens, he would hear his call, right? He'd hear his, his number, his badge number called. He'd go lights and sirens, and they were right where, like where you and I have windshield wipers, right? That's how they'd go lights and sirens. So he had five years of this. He'd, he'd, hear the, he'd hear the call, he'd hear his number, lights and sirens, and go. So adrenaline dump and go. And, and his hand, just that, that muscle memory, that primacy of what he first learned. Then one day, uh, he was with the police department. They splurged for, for new squad cars. Everyone was so excited about these new squad cars they're getting. Except in the new squad cars, to go lights and sirens, it was right here on the center console. And Matt said for months, he would hear his badge number, he'd go, he'd go to get lights and sirens, and he would turn his windshield wipers on. And he'd go, oh wait, turn my windshield wipers off. And he had to come down here to go lights and sirens. Now, why do I share this with you? Who here and who in the chat bounces between different airplanes often, right? You're always in something different. Maybe you're not, you don't own an airplane yet, but you aspire to, who doesn't aspire to own an airplane, right? But you're bouncing between the flight school's 172s, and I'll tell you, three of the 172s out here at Rex Air are just about identical, but they all have different tail numbers. Who's ever just been confused by their tail number? You're so used to flying 100 Papa Mike, and then today they put you in 127 Kilo Whiskey, and you're answering Papa Mike's calls, forgetting that you're Kilo Whiskey, and they're both 172 SPs, right? Everything's in the same spot even. 
Now, when you start to bounce between different manufacturers, and here, uh, the th you know, the throttle is here, but here, oh, the throttle in the Piper is like this, but the or in a Cirrus, it's like this, but in a 172, it's like this. Little things, uh, the manifold pressure gauges here, the RPMs up here. I know uh, some of you have flown, I call it like a shotgun panel, where they just, I don't they have no rhyme or reason to why they put the instruments in that particular order, and they're just all over the place. Little things like that slow you down. So, like when I was doing my Cirrus checkout, I just had a rule that I'm not flying in actual IFR conditions for about the first 10 hours. And I wanted to fly with some good Cirrus instructors. Yeah, I have time in a G1000, but I'm going 160 knots in that. I'm used to flying two, three Mike Zulu at 90 knots. Things just happen, and we'll talk about falling behind the airplane here in just a second. Now, if we revert back to, and if you can show that again, Magda, if we revert back to this idea of primacy, and by the way, Jamie Beckett, that's your cub that I bought from you. I just, anytime I have an opportunity to show the cub that I bought from Jamie, I like to rub it in, because it's only, it's only fair to do. We fall back to primacy. Now, here's a profound thought that I need you, I need you to, to ponder here. Am I just learning to the level of my CFI? Th people don't share this, but think, think about it this way. When I was an early CFI, I was really, really weak at the subject of systems. It just wasn't my thing. Doug will tell you, I don't like to get my hands dirty. You know, all that. I just didn't enjoy systems. So where do you think all my students also shared a deficiency? It was in systems. Unless they were an AMP, or unless they were mechanically inclined to understood all that stuff, they also had a deficiency in systems. So. Another 172. <laughs> I'll grab a sip of coffee while they, while they wind it down. So my students also shared a deficiency in the subject of systems. So I want to ask you a question. Are you just learning to the level of your CFI? If your CFI is in a good CFI who's always learning, you're just going to eventually learn to hear, right? And you're going to kind of plateau. You need to make sure you're with the CFI who's always pushing you and pushing yourself so you continue to learn together with that. Am I just learning to the level of my CFI? This is why I like the idea of sometimes flying with multiple CFIs before a check ride it can always be a huge, huge benefit for us with that. So let's, uh, let's dive into it now that we kind of teed that up a little bit. And let's look as my clicker works. There we go. I want to share with you all quickly here three proven ways to transform the quality of our flying. And that's what we're gonna focus on. We'll nail these three down and I'll let you all get back to enjoying your phenomenal Saturday um, out here. So three proven ways to transform the quality of your flying and the first is this. It's not an emergency if you're ready for it. It's not an emergency if you're ready for it. I, um, I'll share this because I realize there's new people out there watching. I play a really weird game on long cross countries. I play, where would I go if the engine quit? Meaning while I'm flying, I'll pick out that field that's over there. And if my engine quits, that's where I'm going. And as I fly and that field goes further and further back that way, and eventually it's out of my glide distance, I say, okay, that's no longer it. I'm gonna pick that airport over there. Now I don't tell my passengers I'm playing this game because that's, not, that, that's a way to scare your passengers away, but I'm always thinking ahead. It's not an emergency if I'm ready for it. It's not an emergency if I'm training, if I'm thinking ahead for these things. And that's one of the ways. Are we making our emergency approaches to land accurate and realistic? Are we really doing a steep spiral down to a landing? Whatever that may be for your aircraft, you need to work to make that realistic here. And I'm sure he'll taxi away in a second, don't worry. All right, our next little bit. Once we get behind the airplane, it's inherently difficult to catch up. Who here, show of hands, online or in person, who's ever just fallen behind the airplane? Like, it's still going through the sky at 90 knots, but your brain is somewhere back there. Or maybe, uh, maybe you've been on a, uh, on a check ride before, or a mock check ride. This, this is how people fail check rides, by the way. They go up and they do steep turns, and one of their steep turns is kind of crummy, and they hang on to that. But now they're going on, the, the examiner says, let's do stalls. But you're still thinking about your crummy steep turns. But I'll tell you, they happen back there. 
Your crummy steep turns aren't thinking about you anymore. You have to stay in that moment. Leave the bad steep turn behind, leave the bad landing behind, and continue moving forward in everything that we do. So once we get behind the airplane, it's inherently difficult to actually catch up. You know, preparation is the one thing uh, that the master pilot does compared to the average pilot. And, and Magda can be my witness to this. One thing I always do, I'll give an instrument pilot example. I always take the time to brief my approaches here sitting on the ground on my comfy couch. Let me show you how I do this real quick. I'll pull up something like an approach plate, and this is for Tallahassee, let's say. We're going to go to the panhandle today. I don't know why we'd leave Naples, but we're going to go to the panhandle today. I'll go in and I will annotate this entire thing. I'll go in here and I'll get like a highlighter. Yes, this is the RNAV GPS 18 into Tallahassee. My approach course is 184. My touchdown zone elevation is 83. There's my missed approach, my ATIS, my approach, my tower. And I highlight these things to get my eyes to jump ahead of it. And I'm doing all this sitting on the ground on the comfy couch, visualizing myself shooting this approach. I'll line up, I'll probably come into the Custy intersection. Again, I don't know who gets to name these fixes, but they have strange names. To the Sigay intersection, and I highlight all of these, everything that applies to me here, so I'm constantly ahead, and I'm briefing my approach here on the ground. Then I'll go in, and I like to actually type on the chart as well and kind of annotate it. So I'll say, okay, here at Sigay, I need to be at what altitude? I need to be at 3,000 feet. I'll put a 3,000 right there, a 30 to represent 3,000, and I'll drag it right there so I know roughly where I need to be. Then for my next fix, my next fix, uh, Jatma, there. I'll grab Jatma, so I've got that for my final approach fix. Uh, and I'll go ahead, I'll put my altitude actually there. I should be at 2,000 feet, and I'll put that there. So my eyes aren't having to move as much, and it's causing me that muscle memory of practicing this briefing. I still brief it very much in the air, but I do it here on the ground as well to work through. We'll go all the way through with our missed approach and everything else, and we brief our entire approach here on the ground. I'll, I'll show you what that looks like there at the end so you can see it. And you're exactly right. I saw, I see uh, Glenn, your comment in there. It's no different than chair flying. I'll annotate the entire thing so I'm always working to stay ahead of that airplane. That's one thing I'm always looking to do. You know, uh, I learned something interesting a few years ago. Avemco, the insurance company, and I like Avemco because they do, they're all in-house. They don't broker you out. They, it's all in-house. They have all the data. Avemco shared, if we can show it, Magda, 11% of their losses are taxi losses. You know what they said? It's the guy or the gal taxiing, trying to figure out the iPad on the ground, and they taxi into another airplane, or they taxi into the fuel farm. We had one here not too terribly long ago. There was, a, there was a Mooney at the end of the run-up area, and there was a tail dragger, and it's hard to taxi a tail dragger because you're sitting so far back. But they came in, and the tail dragger, the Mooney's just minding his own business, doing his run-up, and the tail dragger didn't see him, taxi right on into him, propeller, ate up the wing and everything else. We had, a, we had an accident on the ground, if that, makes, uh, if that makes any sense. All right, we're back to our contest here. Magnus got it ready. They're coming in. We're going to go for some rotorcraft knowledge now. Let's see who's got the rotorcraft knowledge. You cannot say the Collier County Sheriff's Office. That won't count. I don't, I don't know my helicopter's that good. I'm taking somebody's word on that one. Put it in the chat. What kind of helicopter was that? You say anything, and I may believe you, other than like an R44. All right. So 11% of Avemco's losses are taxi losses. It just boggles my mind if we're, we're bending metal here on the ground. Uh, Mike says it's a chopper. Mike is, he's like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, let's see, let's see. I don't think it's a raven. It's a bell of some sort. Somebody give me a bell. I just saw, I'm gonna go with Jason McKean. Jason McKean said a bell 407. It's definitely a bell product, I, I don't know, but we're making the rules up as we go. So it is a Bell 407. Uh, I saw it go by. McKean was the last name. There he is. And his first name is Jason. So he's a winner in my book as well. <laughs> Email Sarah, sarahdemsray.com, subject line. I'm a winner. Jason said so. You're, we're shipping you something amazing. I don't know what it is entirely. But we'll go through it. All right, let's keep moving forward with our presentation because I promise we'll be done by two. And I got I to hustle here. How can we work to stay ahead of our airplane? 
we're talking about briefing our approaches on the ground and VFR pilots, right? You can be looking at the sectional charts. One thing I do, it sounds so, so nerdy. I was just doing it yesterday, actually. I will go on Google Earth or Google Maps if I'm going to a different airport, and I will scope the snot out of that new little airport. If I take off runway 14 and I have an engine failure, there's a cow pasture over there, and that's where I'm going. Or wow, when I'm approaching 14, look, there's this um, there's this big building there. That'd be a good area to turn my left base over. And I look at the airports I'm going to if I haven't been to them on Google Earth, on Google Maps. Forflight has a decent feature they're getting close to. Um, kind of showing it three-dimensionally. It's good, but it's not perfect um, just yet. So I'm always working to stay ahead. You know, if you're not asking yourself what's next in the airplane, you're gonna end up falling behind the airplane. Where are my instrument pilots at? Any instrument pilots here live with me yet? Instrument rate is still working on it? Okay, oh, there you are, Terry. Good to see you, Terry. Um, so Terry, you know this then, and you know the struggle when you're becoming an instrument pilot, and any instrument pilots watch online, this was probably the worst radio call you'd ever get. Terry, what's your tail number again? So he would hear a 394 Charlie Pop, you're five miles from Fibus, turn left, heading 330, maintain 3000 till established, you're cleared, ILS runway 36, approach into Ocala. And you go, that's when you look at your instructor. Anybody ever have one of those moments where you look at your instructor like, save me, I, I, I don't know what they just said to me. And they give you just that mouthful of a clearance. You can fall behind the airplane so easily in VFR or IFR, but IFR especially because the radio communications can be so demanding. And if you struggled with radio communications early on, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You're thinking, what if I say the wrong thing? Or what if I sound stupid? Or what if I don't know what they said to me? And you're thinking about that, but you're hurtling through the sky in a hunk of metal or carbon fiber, Cirrus pilots, I don't want to offend any Cirrus pilots, Terry, or anything like that, in a hunk of materials, um, still going through the sky and worrying about radio calls. We have to always be asking ourselves and thinking what is next in our aircraft. Next, are you really practicing emergencies or are you just going through the motions? I shared this um, at actually at an event here and I shared it at an aviation master event. I wanna share it again um, with you all. I wanna give you three examples. And again, I'm gonna go back to the law enforcement environment. Um, in Minneapolis, they were uh, at, at their police department, they were practicing, if a weapon is pulled on me, how do I disarm the bad guy? So two officers stood across from each other. One would pull the fake weapon on him. The other officer perform the maneuver, take the weapon away, and then hand it back to him so they could practice again. They'd pull the weapon, perform the takeaway maneuver, hand it back, and over and over they would practice this. Well, one day a Minneapolis police officer was out on the streets, had a weapon pulled on him, and what do you think he did? He went right back to his primacy, his training. He performed the maneuver perfectly, he took the weapon away, and he <laughs> handed it right back to the bad guy. You can imagine what the bad guy was like, what, what just happened? You can imagine the officer too. The officer then performed the maneuver, took it away, and kept it away this time. Now, because of that incident, at police departments around the country, there's three officers involved. The bad guy, the good guy, and the officer who takes the weapon and returns it back. So someone pulls the weapon, right? I perform the maneuver, they take it away, and they put it back here on a table. And a third officer takes the weapon and goes around. So this officer in training never builds the muscle memory of handing it right back. You see, this applies so perfectly to aviation. I'll give you a VFR, and I'll give you an IFR example. In the VFR environment, how do we do our emergency procedures? We go out over a beautiful place like Naples, we say. Our instructor, because those, those instructors are pains in the butt, right? They pull our throttle back to idle, and they say, I'm so sorry, Marilyn, your engine just quit. And you go, okay, no, no problem. I watched an M0A video on this one. Jason talks about the ABCs. Airspeed, got it. Best landing area. We're going to the beach over there. That looks good. Checklist. I run through my entire flow checklist. Everything is great and you're coming down, then we have this pesky little rule and regulation that talks about no lower than 1,000 feet in a congested area, 500 feet in a other than congested area, as it says. So what do your instructors always make you do? You get about 550 feet AGL, and they tell you, good job, Jason, go around. But let me tell you something. It's easy to go from 3,000 feet, run a few checklists, and go down to 500 feet. Where the money is made is from 500 feet to the ground. It's that field you picked out was recently tilled up and it's got all these ruts in it. Or those little brown specks in that field, those are really cows. 
or there's a fence or whatever, or you're going towards the beach and you didn't realize there's that many swimmers. There's all these little factors that you forget about. And then not to mention, if you've never done a real soft field landing, I mean, physically touch down on the grass, and if you fly out of Naples, there's a grass runway right out there, so there's no reason not to. It's not the smoothest in the world, but it'll give you a good real world experience. Is your most important landing of your life that you're about to make gonna also be your first real soft field landing? Because if you've landed on grass, it's a different ball game. It is, it's jarring, it's bumpy, it's a, it's a quick stop, it's all these things. Who, has anybody here done a real soft field landing? Real soft field? Awesome. Jamie Beckett, I'm so proud of you. In the chat, anybody ever done a real soft field? Grass, dirt. I mean, if you're in Alaska landing on gravel, like you just, you won a lot of cool points with me and everything else. Magda, is there a jet coming? Let's see. Oh, I know that we got this. Ready? Send it. Oh. We had to go vertical video there in the rush. In the rush. What was it? Put it in the chat. What was it? Don't excuse the vertical video. Magda's working. She's got eight hands over there making it all work. All right. But if you've never done a real soft field landing, there's a possibility that could be your first real soft field landing. That's a scary thing to think about. So my challenge to you would be, let's go find, it'd be hard to do it in Naples because it's so busy. Let's go find a, a soft field where I can be up at 3000 feet, spiral down for a landing on that grass field, or even just spiral down for a landing. It's a precision approach from 3000 feet. Who got it? It's a Lear product of some sort, that much I know. So I will accept just about any Learjet answer at this point, other than like a 25 or a 35. It's either a 45 or a 65, I'm not sure. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go, hold on, hold on. I'm, I'm trying to find somebody I don't know. I'm trying to find somebody I don't know. Um, no, I know all these people, I know all these people. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I, of course I know Eric Pittman. Hold on. Who's, yeah, I need, I need a new person to win. I need a new person, or new, new to me. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Hold on, uh, Jax, Jax Pergola on Facebook. It's a Learjet, it's technically 55. Here comes another one though, hold on. Jax, you're a winner. We're still on vertical video. I mean, Coach Ray is cringing right now from this vertical video. Oh, this is a good one. Don't tell him, don't tell him because you can see the logo. This is brand spanking new. That's like a 2022. Bonus points, bonus points for that one. That's, that's on my, my Think and Grow Rich list right there. That's, that's the, that, and that can do a real soft field landing, by the way. It's actually made off of its, it has a turboprop version. There's a hint for you. No, it is not a citation. It's new, it's new. There's probably less than 100 of them flying right now. It's new. It starts with a P, but it's not a phenom. It starts with a P, but it's not a phenom. If the manufacturer name starts with a P. And you know the turboprop very, very well, I bet. Oh, I just saw it above. I just saw it above, Magda. Up, 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 up a little bit. All right. Mamado, Mamdo, Al, oh man, I'm bad at names. Alms up. Let's show it to him. That's the new PC24. So remember, we have the Pilatus PC12, also on my, my like, I, I need more friends, that's the thing. I think if I had a PC-12, I'd have more friends to fill the seats with. But when I get more friends, that's what I'm gonna get. And that's what I'm gonna take. And that's the jet version that they claim, and I've seen videos, it does like legit soft field landings in like the African bush and stuff. Like that's, speaking of soft field landings, that was good. PC-24, good job, good job. So we talked about a VFR example. Your homework is to spiral down from 3,000 feet and land somewhere, somewhere legally. All right, just be careful, I'm looking at you there, all right? What about an IFR example here? I just pick on people I like, don't worry, okay? How about an IFR example? Um, I had an IFR student, now instrument rated pilot, probably one of my best instrument students. I'm talking just rock solid. We'd put those foggles on. You would swear the autopilot was on sometimes. He just flew so, so good. We're about two or three flights out from his check ride and I woke up and it was this gorgeous stratus layer nice stable air and I had this idea that so this is the perfect day because he didn't have any actual instrument time and if you've flown an actual and Terry you know this the hood and the foggles and actually sticking your head in the clouds night and day couldn't be any more different the foggles it feels like cheating after you stuck your head really in a cloud 
So I said, this is great because it doesn't have any instrument in the cloud time. So we're gonna go ahead and do this. So we take off, we hit this Stratus layer, and my rock star instrument student is all of a sudden doing one of these and all over the place and just showing you how different it is in the clouds versus the foggles. So we're all over the place. We're shooting the approach on in. He is all over the localizer so bad we lose the localizer and he has to go mist. So I had this idea. He flies so good with the foggles on, I'm just gonna put the foggles on him. It makes perfect sense, right? I put the foggles on him to kind of trick him in a way and all of a sudden he's a rock star again. He can't see outside, but he's a rock star again. So he's flying so good, but the foggles put his mind into training mode. So here we are, so listen, let's make this one a full stop because you're a little tired, I'm a little tired. We're coming on in. He's rock solid on the localizer. The glide slope is perfect. I mean, this is gonna be a gorgeous instant approach. I said, listen, I'm gonna look outside. I'll let you know when I see lights or anything like that. It's gonna be close down to minimums. You just focus on flying. I'm stretching my neck, hoping to see anything. I kind of look down, I start to see some trees. I'm like, okay, we're gonna see something here in a bit. All of a sudden, about 100 feet above minimums, I go, I see the lights. A little bit loud, perhaps. And I was excited because we're gonna get to land. He goes, carb heat, full power, and goes around. I looked at him, I said, what are you doing? And just like this, he goes, I don't know. He was so in training mode because what do we do in the instrument environment? We shoot an approach, we go miss. We shoot an approach, we go miss. The only landing you do is to land the airplane to call it a day. You just get so good at go arounds. And in our first real world environment, primacy that was built was we shoot an approach and we go missed. But when's the last time you shot an approach and actually land the plane? Because my, my double eyes here and everything will tell you that you're coming in, you break out at 200 feet AGL, you only have 10 degrees of flaps in or 50% of flaps in a Cirrus. You've got to get the flaps in, lower that nose and land that airplane quickly because you're at 200 feet already. You're moving very, very quickly. So when you step into the instrument environment, Land the airplane occasionally would be, my, would be my advice to you coming out of an instrument approach like that. And um, as we kind of get ready to wrap this up here, you see, we must continue to pursue knowledge. Knowledge isn't power. Knowledge is just potential power. You have to know when to use that knowledge. We all know somebody uh, who will tell you how to run your finances or run your business, but their own finances are in disarray, their own business in disarray. We all have that friend that wants to give you relationship advice and you're looking at their own marriage and you're going, I, I don't want what you have. Why are you giving me advice, right? Those aren't the people you, you take wisdom from, right? Knowledge isn't power, it's potential power. They can have the knowledge, but I wanna see you apply it in your own relationships, in your own finances, in your own airplane as well, in your own flight training. So I can make you the smartest pilot, but if you can't exercise good decision-making and know when to apply that knowledge, it's all in vain. So what are you gonna be doing the rest of this year to continue to pursue more knowledge? Is it the transition to the Cirrus? Is it the uh, working on my instrument? Is it just getting back in the airplane maybe, right? It's been a while, whatever that may be, set yourself up and schedule it because what gets scheduled gets done. You know, they say in, uh, in the legal field, it's not the lawyer who knows the most law that wins. It's the one who best prepares his or her case who actually ends up winning it. So as we get to say goodbye, I'm only three minutes long. We will open up for questions here in a second. As we get ready to say goodbye, I wanna leave you all with hopefully what you perceive as three, I'm sorry, four bits of wisdom and I wanna gear it towards kind of everybody that's out there. So uh, first up to my private pilots here. Private pilots, I need you to realize this, that every situation is new. We must let what we know guide us, but not blind us to what we do not know. We must remain flexible and adaptable to any situation and must always retain that beginner's mind and must never overvalue our experience or undervalue the information served up to us moment by moment as we fly. For my instrument pilots watching this, remember that preparation is the one thing the average instrument pilot does very little of and the master pilot does consistently every single flight. I know there's some commercial pilots out there watching. Flying is all about testing yourself, growing, preparing all your options so when you're flying, there's nothing that hasn't been thought of or practiced. Do the work before you need it so you know what you're capable of when everyone else hits the panic button. 
I know there's a few CFIs out there as well. Don't teach others the way you want to be taught. Teach them the way they need to be taught. Always be reminding yourself that a student is only going to learn to your level, so continue to raise yours. And really, to everybody else out there, I want to wish you just tremendous success on your journey. Thank you for making in-flight coffee 100 episodes in a row. And thank you for making uh, m 0 a the best online ground school out there. We certainly couldn't do it without you all. Thank you to everybody who took the time to come out here. I know many of you flew in as well, drove in. You all are absolutely outstanding. For those of you here in person, don't forget to get your gifts. For those of you watching online and here in person, let's just do Q&A for a little bit, and then we'll kind of wrap with some more giveaways and everything else. Let's start here in Naples, though, while you all type in some questions in the chat. And Magda, if you'll save me a few uh, good questions while they type those in. Any questions from anybody here uh, by chance? Anything, anything aviation related? More than happy to chat about. Yes, ma'am. Sure. So the question is, new student pilot, should I get for flight or should I wait? I have two schools of thought with this. I believe you should learn, first off, how to master for flight on the ground. But first, we've got to master the airplane. So what I've done with my students is, before solo, it's just you in the airplane, getting a feel for that airplane, eyes outside, learn that you're working on a VFR certificate. So everything outside. Then after we solo, I, want to, I do want to introduce that into the cockpit because next is solo cross countries. I want you to have all available resources to make you that safer, smarter pilot. Now, I'm fine with that as long as you make me a promise that it doesn't, number one, become a crutch. Like if you think flight planning is Naples to Ocala, enter, follow the pink line, we're, we're gonna have to have a talk, right? That's not good flight planning like that. So I still want you to learn the old school flight plan. I'm still a fan of like manual E6Bs just to learn it to fall back on. I know we don't use it in the airplane anymore, but to have a raw skill set to fall back on. And as long as, remember we talked about Avemco, 11% of their losses are taxi losses. As long as you're not doing one of these the entire time, looking down at it. But if you master it on the couch, then you can add it into the cockpit from there. Great, great question. Any other questions here in Naples? Yeah, my friend, Brewers, wow. Yes, advice to a new, so uh, the question is, what advice for a new instrument pilot? How new? Like, will I pass my check right or new instrument student? New instrument student, got my private pilot, got flew 60 hours. Awesome. So what advice for a new instrument student diving into it? If you, how are your radio communications? Let's start with that. Okay, good. He says radio communications are good. So my first advice would be, if they weren't good, we gotta make them good and then gooder after that, right? We have to make our radio communications much, much better. Getting VFR flight following. You fly out of Naples here? No, Wisconsin. Oh, you're flying Wisconsin. You came all the way from Wisconsin just to hang out with us? I did. No way. Yeah. Wow! <laughs> all the way from Wisconsin just to hang out with us? That, make sure he gets two prizes. I mean, that's some serious stuff. That's, and we'll see you at Oshkosh then for sure. Yeah, I'm only an hour from Oshkosh. No way. So the story I was telling about Matt, that was uh, Nina PD. Okay. Who's the, it was, who was you with? So anyways. Um, Yes, new instrument student, you need to be diving into as much VFR flight falling as you can get. And then start doing these real world cross countries. I imagine at 260 hours, you have uh, the 50 hours of PIC cross country that you need, that you need for the check. Close, take the spouse, take the family, whatever. Let's start showing ourselves that flying's fun and let's start going places like that. And then don't be afraid when there's that business trip you have to do or whatever you need to use the airplane for, take a CFI with you. Let's do an instrument cross country. And please, 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 Get your head in the clouds. Legally, on an IFR flight plan, I want you to shoot an approach in actual conditions. I'll say this, it's a bold statement. I get picked on a few times for it. I'm not a fan of like, go to Arizona for the 10 day accelerated IFR thing. You will earn your instrument rating, but you will fly on a day like today, it was not a cloud in the sky, you won't even know what a cloud looks like, and you'll be an instrument rated pilot. Then you come back to Florida, or you go to Wisconsin, and they have these afternoon thunderstorms, you think, I'm instrument rated. And you go blazing through that and you hurt yourself. So take your time with it. Are you going to do it in your own airplane? Or what are you thinking? A buddy's airplane. Buddy's 172. Okay, that's perfect. 
I like also staying in the same instrument platform. Don't go bouncing between Steam and G1000, pick one and roll with it. I love G1000 if you have the option for it. And make sure, like we said earlier, master that iPad, whichever app you choose to use. Great question. Thank you for making the trip, my friend. That's awesome, that's awesome. Other questions, other comments here? Magni, you have some in the chat for me? Eric Pittman, CEO of Publix, everybody, if you need anything from Publix. Is it easier to get your 107 after your private or does it matter? So Eric Pittman, remember how 107 works. So when Eric's talking about 107 is the drone, right? Drone certificate. It's easier after you earn your private pilot, Eric, because it's just a simple online, you can't even fail it kind of test. Earn your private, then do your 107. If you want to do your 107 before your private, you have to take an, uh, an additional written test, the remote pilot written test, of which m has an amazing course for. All right, Hunter, what's happening? Does flying instrument approaches matter for single or multi-engine, or can they be combined to stay current? Wow, what a good little question. So how does it read? We need six full instrument approaches, is how it actually reads, right? Remember, we can do those via, we can do an IPC to get those six done. We could do some of those in a simulator with the CFI, and we can do those in an aircraft, a category of class or aircraft that we are rated for as well. So good, good question on that one. Claire, good to see you. Any advice for an IPC, that's what we we're just talking about, for a, a rusty instrument pilot? IPC, instrument proficiency check. So like Hunter, good job on those questions, Mag. They tee each other up nicely. Um, to maintain currency, and we're not after currency, right? We're after proficiency and then mastery thereafter. To maintain that though, in an instrument environment, I need six instrument approaches within a rolling six month period. If I fall out of that, I have the option to go do like Claire was asking, which is an IPC. Something I do with an instructor. It's like a flight review for instrument. Um, Claire, what I would do is I would tell that instructor you're doing it with, your IPC, depending on how rusty you are, probably won't be just one flight. It might be two or three flights. So I would encourage you to get three or four flights on the books and make sure you focus on the ground first. Make sure you hop in a simulator first, something like that, and don't expect your IPC to be one flight. Rusty pilots out there, don't expect your flight review to be one flight. It's been 10 years. Take your time, book five flights out so you feel good. And, and even, uh, you know, AOPA talks about re-soloing, like soloing again. I think that's an awesome, awesome idea. So, great. Let's do a few more here. Ray says, uh, is it better to start a new student's training in glass or six pack? That's a great question. Similar to the four flight type question, I like eyes outside. I'm okay if you wanna do G1000 the entire time, as long as you promise me I know it's a beautiful screen, you're not gonna understand it, but you're not gonna understand round aisle gauges at the beginning either. Your eyes need to be outside. I'm okay starting at G1000 at ground one, or ground zero, as long as you promise me your eyes will be outside and that G1000 won't serve as a jailer when it should really be an asset with that. Jason Cunningham, great name. Tips for studying for the private pilot test and check ride. Well, Jason, we're gonna ask you a question right now. Can we put Jason on the spot, does that mean to do? We're gonna ask him a question right now. Jason's mock check ride for all the marbles, and then I'll give him his advice too. Let's see, let's see. Uh, Jason Cunningham, what is hypoxia? That's your question. And you're gonna win something if you get it right, Jason Cunningham. What is hypoxia? Jason Cunningham, one of the best things you can do. Um, anybody use any of the check ride books on audiobook? Anybody here use the audiobook or the paperback book? I know there's a ton online that have. Listen to the audiobook. I know you gotta listen to me for like four hours of reading this book, but I promise you uh, it will serve you greatly. Get out there, Jason, do some mock check rides and continue to stay just involved in that process, flying twice a week, get a different set of eyes, a different perspective from a CFI as well. So great, great question. Let's just take one more. Any questions here? Any other questions here? I don't wanna miss anybody. You can always ask me afterwards too. You want two, my one's two more. There's a B in here. Ron G, what's happening? Is it best to start IFR training with no delay after the private, or is it best to get more time before? I like, Ron, I like a little bit of time between private and instrument. But what was the name again? Your name again? John. John has 260 hours. How long ago was private pilot? Oh, 20 years. Don't let 20 years go between Ron or anything like that. <laughs> Ron, I like two, three months kind of in between. 
I made the mistake of forgetting to show myself flying was fun. I passed my private pilot check ride. The next day was instrument lesson number one. I forgot to show myself that flying was fun. I was just always training. And you get burned out when you're always training like that. Plus, you need 50 hours of PIC cross country time. Anyways, earn your private pilot. All your passengers that want to fly with you, take them somewhere greater than 50 nautical miles away. So you log in this PIC cross country time. You start building that time towards your 50 hours of PIC for the instrument check ride. Um, and show yourself that flying's fun and enjoy that process. So uh, that's that. All right, Magnus says last question. Melissa wants to know, who flew the furthest to be here in person today? I mean, Wisconsin's gonna be hard to beat. Anybody more than Wisconsin? Anybody more than Wisconsin? John wins it coming all the way from Wisconsin. That's, I mean, I mean, Magda's family did come from Mallorca, but I don't know if that counts. So <laughs> congratulations. So listen, M Missouri Nation, you all are just absolutely outstanding. I want to thank everybody who took time out of your Saturday to be here in person. Don't forget Marty Miller's cheesecake is over there and ready. We don't want it to melt. There's more cold Dunkin' Donuts coffee. I mean, what else isn't to like about that? I'll be sticking around here for questions or pictures, everything else. Everybody else watching online, episode 101 is next week and you're gonna be soothed by uh, the wonderful Jamie Beckett next week. I'm gonna take a week off and Jamie Beckett's gonna bring it for you next week. Thank you so much uh, for 100 episodes of success. Here is to 100 more episodes as well. Have a just blessed, abundant, outstanding rest of your day. And remember to be a light to everyone you come into contact this week and more. And most importantly, remember that a good pilot is always learning. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see ya.